All right, good evening, everybody. Um, you're very welcome to lecture, um, tonight's lecture from the Civil Division of Engineers Ireland. Uh, both people here in the lecture room and people watching in through the internet on the web. Um, our lecture tonight is about the Carrington Gas Pipeline, CCGT Gas Pipeline. And the lecture this evening um, is from ESBI. As a Don McKenna, who's a chartered engineer and a senior consultant with responsibility for delivery of energy infrastructure projects in the Civil Building Environment Engineering Department within ESBI. And he's worked many on many of the ESBI's power generation projects in Ireland and the UK, and has also worked on thermal power plants projects in Vietnam, Abu Dhabi, Namibia. And Don has a BSc degree in civil engineering from Queen's University, Belfast, and an MSc degree in structural steel design from the Imperial College of Science and Technology in London. So you're very welcome, and uh, we'll leave it to yourself now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, this presentation is about the Carrington gas pipeline project for the Carrington CCGT power plant. Uh, what the presentation will involve is the description of the project, a description of the concept design, and uh, detailed design and a description of the actual construction of the Carrington gas pipeline. The contract for construction of the gas pipeline was uh, a design and build contract uh, and the contractor was ultimately responsible for the design. The uh, Carrington 860 megawatt CCGT combined cycle gas turbine project, power plant project, is being developed by Carrington Power Limited. Carrington Power Limited is a company within the generation and wholesale markets business unit of ESB. Uh, this Carrington project is a key project within the ESB strategy to 2025, wherein the, the plan is to expand the generation capacity to a total of 7,000 megawatts in the all islands uh, generation per generation market. Uh, the client, as I said, is Carrington Power Limited, and the owner's engineer for this project, power plant and gas pipeline, is uh, ESBI Engineering. The project location, site location, the project uh, is located in Carrington, just outside Manchester, and uh, some idea there of the location, the actual location of the power plant project is uh, on the banks of the River Mersey, where the River Mersey meets Manchester Ship Canal. The actual site of the power plant, which is top uh, centre in yellow there, is the site of a former coal-fired power plant. The gas pipeline route is shown in red there. The gas pipeline, the gas would be natural gas supplied from the national grid compound in Partington, which is shown bottom centre here, the area in yellow as well, and the actual gas pipeline route is shown in red. This particular project was uh, bought by Carrington Power Limited as a developed project. Uh, this meant that, or what this entailed was, that the planning permission for the power plant and the planning permission for the gas pipeline were already procured as part of the procured package. In fairness, it was recognised at the procurement stage uh, of this project uh, by Carrington Power Limited that the gas pipeline route would probably be problematic in terms of its construction. And uh, we'll deal with that uh, within the presentation. Um, actual description of the terrain, description of the site and the surroundings. This is an aerial shot of the project uh, site. The Carrington gas, combined cycle gas tur turbine per plant site is shown here in bottom right uh, in yellow adjacent uh, to the Manchester Ship Canal and the River Mersey. Uh, working down then you have the red line which shows the gas pipeline route. The r distance from the Carrington per plant site to the National Grid feeder in Partington is a total distance of 2.4 kilometres. Uh, of this 2.4 kilometres of gas pipeline route, 1.1 kilometres would be along the Manchester Ship Canal. Uh, describing first of all the elevation or the topography of the area, 
The per plant site itself is approximately 14, these are approximate uh, MOD levels here, is approximately 14.5 metre level, working your way down along Manchester Ship Canal. Manchester Ship Canal is at the level of operating level of 8.3 metres. The adjacent embankment on which or in which there is uh, an old culvert uh, is at 11.3 metre level and there are adjacent embankments uh, rising to uh, 26 metres over a distance of about 20 metres laterally. Uh, then you, at the bottom of the culvert moving up onto what's called Jetty Road, the ground level there is 20 metres approximately, that is Jetty Road moving out towards Manchester Road, crossing Manchester Road and into the NG gas compound area which is at 19.0 metre level. Um, some history really of the construction and the, the reason why this site and why both the per plant site and the gas pipeline site are in brown, brownfield terrain. Uh, the gas works, the national grid uh, Greater line and compound as it currently stands is on the site of a previous gas works, an extensive previous gas works. Uh, moving back up along Jetty Road and uh, coming uh, in at the adjacent to the canal here along the pipeline route, you will see on the eastern side, north is towards me at the top of the slide here. On the eastern side, you'll see Peaksnook landfill. This here is a landfill with uncontrolled landfill which operated from about 1960 to the mid 90s and it is known was known that there was asbestos uh, tipped in this landfill there was all sorts of building rubble tipped there right there was old tires tipped there and there was really no control in this landfill the landfill itself was capped in 1996 uh, moving forward then towards the main per plant site, uh, the next area which is in the lighter green area is the site of ice disposal. Ice disposal is from the previous operating coal fired per plant but also previous to that there this was the site of a Victorian waste site. Uh, with regard to the overall uh, terrain here on the right hand side or on the western side of the uh, Manchester Ship Canal in this area here that was the site of a previous steelworks and you will find or we have found that there's a lot of clinker uh, deposited in the particularly in the national grid gas compound area but you could come across clinker anywhere here. The proposed gas pipeline itself, uh, moving forward to and uh, describing exactly what the detail of the gas pipeline was, the gas pipeline would be a 600 mil diameter gas pipeline of thickness uh, 19 millimetres. With regard to the, these embankments that I am going to talk about maybe uh, uh, during quite a lot during the presentation, uh, just pictorially moving from the per plant site down towards national grid, uh, you will see on the left hand side there's these embankments in ash material rising as I said from 11.3 metre level which is the roof of the culvert uh, to about 23-25 metres at the top of those embankments. This, uh, the culverts are shown in this particular photograph here. It appears that everything is nice and clean and all the rest, right? Really, uh, there is a story that the previous developer did not realise that there was a culvert uh, along this particular canal. Uh, the area was so overgrown, first of all, and soil from slips in these embankments had actually engulfed the culvert. Well, that is true or not, uh, Look, it remains, uh, well, it's said that that was the case anyway. Uh, look, with regard to looking back up over the culvert again, you can see that the culvert is cleaned here. And uh, you can see the Manchester Ship Canal on your left-hand side, approximately a distance of about 15 metres, 12 to 15 metres from this particular culvert. Again, the embankments, these embankments uh, are, rising, are rising on your right-hand side there. Probably easier terrain uh, for the gas pipeline along Jetty Road. This is a view looking back from Manchester Road before the actual pipeline crosses Manchester Road. This is a view back up along Jetty Road. The one area of greenfield construction, the, this gas pipeline, was in this brown field here, which we call the farmer's field, a distance or width of about 90 metres. Uh, you can see pipelines here on the left-hand side along Jetty Road. Those are polypropylene pipelines to a shell or from a shell offloading 
shipping facility along the Manchester Ship Canal at the head of Jetty Road. <coughs> Looking in the tr at the type of terrain we have a national grid compound, this is a little bit uh, fooling at the end of the day because although it appears a greenfield site, there is a lot of foundation services buried or covered up in this green area and to a lesser extent moving down towards the feeder you can see uh, obstructions, uh, foundations and some services. Uh, typical uh, of the embankment was, first of all, when you walk along this embankment and looked at it, there's no uniformity with, the, with regard to the grading of the embankment. It is just tip material practically for the full length of material. There's some plateaus, some uh, very steep portions of embankment. And uh, towards the lower end of the canal, you can see uh, in this photograph on the right hand side, top there, there is a lot of seepage actually coming out of the canal. And, uh, or of the embankment, sorry. Uh, this particular shot below here shows that even in dry weather, there's a lot of seepage coming out of that embankment. With regard to what were the feasible or possible construction options for the gas pipeline route itself, uh, for Jetty Road and National Grid compound construction challenges. Uh, at the initial stages, it was apparent that existing services and foundations and potential ground contamination would be the, some of the issues that would pose challenges for the construction. However, it was deemed that, look, open cut construction would be the predominant uh, construction method along National Grid or in National Grid and along Jetty Road. For the road crossings, micro tunnels would probably be the construction method primarily in an attempt or for the reason that we did not want to induce settlement on the roads. Uh, the Manchester Road itself, there was a high pressure gas pipeline going down that road underneath this gas pipeline route. Uh, there's also high voltage, medium voltage cables in that particular road. With regard to the uh, canal, the section of pipeline around the canal, really the construction challenges were pretty apparent uh, even in a walk down uh, along that uh, culvert. Uh, the construction challenges would be the existence of a non-engineered embankment, weak ground, potential contaminated land, uh, an existing concrete culvert and uh, a an adjacent commercial operational canal. The, this Manchester Ship Canal is commercial uh, operated. And uh, just with regard to the historic power plant that was on this site and the culvert, they were constructed in, 19, in the early 1950s and the plant was decommissioned and demolished to ground level at, uh, in the early 1990s. Some of the infrastructure with regard to the power plant that occurred or would occur along this gas pipeline route was, first of all, the culvert, as I've mentioned. But up towards the power plant site uh, in this area here, there is a cooling water pump house, which was demolished to ground level. There was an existing basement there, which is approximately eight metres deep. Uh, as, and this would actually be uh, in the line of the gas pipeline route. Construction options for the canal. Uh, at the outset, it was probably appreciated or understood that, look, open cut construction would not prevail or was not a possible construction method along the canal. And uh, given the embankment issues, which appeared to be pretty uh, onerous, uh, the construction techniques or construction method along this canal would probably be uh, trenchless construction, such as horizontal directional drill or uh, another option which was proposed was put the pipeline into the existing culvert. Look, uh, the Carrington Power Limited client, uh, there was a good collaborative approach uh, between the engineer and the client on this particular project, both on the power plant and on the gas pipeline project. Uh, look, these options presented themselves, or these problems presented themselves for the gas pipeline route, and it was agreed with uh, Carrington Power Limited that look, a gas pipeline consultant would be engaged to look at pro constructing this pipeline in the <coughs> culvert. First of all, mainly from a gas compliance, a national grid gas compliance point of view, uh, the operating pressure for the gas pipeline would be 75 uh, bar gauge. And the issues here really were, look, how, what national grid requirements should be complied and was it feasible to put this pipeline 
in the covert and meet national grid requirements. Uh, the gas pipeline consultant were not required to look at the quantitative issues with regard to uh, establishing that this culvert could have a design life of 40 years, which was the required design life, and could provide the actual structural capacity and stability. That there, the issues with regard to investigating the whole area, ground conditions, the stability of the area, the condition of the culvert, and all engineering aspects with regard to providing a stable gas pipeline along that particular canal would be carried out by ESBI engineering. With a view to inputting into the options of putting the pipeline in the culvert or a horizontal directional drill. Uh, a programme of investigations, just a high level uh, list here of what the investigations that ESBA Engineering carried out, uh, pre-detailed uh, design was topographical survey of the embankments and interestingly, uh, the topographical survey for these embankments was carried out using a rope access subcontractor because it was not possible for the surveyors to actually walk uh, up these embankments uh, and accessibility was an issue. Uh, an intensive geotechnical site investigations program, a program of geophysical investigations to establish ground stratification, uh, existing below ground services and features. Uh, also with regard to the culvert, it was drawings were uh, not available for this culvert, right? So. Uh, look, there were some details that we had established with regard to the culvert was, first of all, if it was piled, and secondly, what were the length of piles underneath the culvert, and also proving if there was piles or not underneath that pump house. So geophysical techniques were used with regard to these particular investigations. Uh, the program investigations would include stability analysis of the embankments and non-invasive condition inspection of the culvert. The, the client really didn't own the culvert. They had a lease on the use of the culvert, so we just couldn't, if we wanted to, go in and take out sections of that culvert in a safe way to establish what the construction details <coughs> were. And having looked at the condition of the culvert as best or as far as it was reasonably possible, assess the structural capacity of the culvert. Uh, the geophysical investigations would comprise ground penetrating radar, electrical resistivity, seismic refraction, surface wave ground stiffness, and downhole magnetometry. Downhole magnetometry was principally used to establish the length of the, or the piles underneath the culvert and also investigate if there were piles underneath the pump house. Uh, just I've shown a shot here of the services and the network of services, both redundant and existing within National Grid, and it's quite daunting, really, at the end of the day. Uh, we, the, the project required that a gas pipeline was fed through these services safely. The site investigations, we carried out very detailed site investigations along this 1,100 metres of uh, pipeline route along the canal. In total, 30 boreholes approximately were uh, drilled in the embankment. The actual location of each borehole had to be reviewed and for safe access and for feasibility. And uh, in fact, the, the investigations where uh, the client actually brought in a third party technical appraiser to look at the locations that were proposed to be investigated with regard to safety of access and uh, the, that there was no impact on the stability of these embankments. The, the geophysical investigations I show there in the top right hand corner, I just want to allude to that, the sandstone discontinuity, I will describe what the findings were, but the borehole or the site investigations did establish that, look, there was sandstone primarily at zero meter level, the top of the culvert is 11 metre level, the operating level of the canal was 8.3 metre level, that sandstone bedrock occurred approximately at zero metre right up along the full length of the canal. However, the borehole investigations established that within a 40 metre length, uh, we lost sandstone totally and boreholes to 30 metres were not uh, showing sandstone. So one of the geophysical investigations that we carried out was an investigation to actually uh, plot the profile of this sandstone discontinuity. This would be later useful for the horizontal directional drill. 
establishing the actual build up or the stratification, the general stratification along the canal, I've shown, included two slides here really, which shows sandstone approximately zero meter level uh, underneath the culvert, uh, dense sands and gravels, alluvium overlying the sandstone, dense sands and gravels, stiffer clays, and then clays and silts, soft uh, mixed clays and silts, and made ground comprising ice, clay and canal dredgings up to 8 metres depth in some places. With regard to stability of these embankments, we carried out stability analysis of a huge number of sections right along the canal and practically everyone was showing uh, instability. Uh, the criteria for instability, we were looking at 5 tonne and 10 tonne per metre length slips. And uh, just to highlight the point that these were real instability issues, uh, along one of the sections at the lower end of the canal towards where the Peaksnook landfill is, you can see that we're highlighting here a landfill slip towards the uh, level of the culvert and actually the in situ you can see that this landslip or this slip has occurred or is occurring. Um, another section uh, embankment or stability section section 9 the um, the analysis actually showed that this was uh, had a factor of safety less than one. And actually, during the tendering period for this particular contract, there was a slip occurred here, which is approximately about 70 metres long. This picture uh, attempts to show you that particular slip. So generally along the embankment we were finding that look while there was no deep seated uh, instability which would take out the culvert in totality, there was slips uh, predominant right across or right for the full length of the embankments. So many of the findings uh, of our investigations, the embankments comprised up to eight metres depth of canal dredgings, ice uh, deposits and soft material. There were st stability issues with the embankment. Sandstone bedrock varied uh, along this canal route between minus three uh, metres AOD at the lower end down towards where the Peaks Nook landfill was to plus two at the upper end before the sandstone discontinuity occurred where the sandstone was lost. Uh, investigation of the culvert and really we had very, very few drawings on which to carry out investigations of the structural capacity of the culvert. But uh, from cover meter survey and from some drawings which couldn't be proven whether they were as constructed or not, uh, there was a load restriction on that culvert of seven and a half tons, or there would be a load restriction on that culvert of seven and a half tons. The lateral stability mechanism was not evident for the culvert at all. There was some differential settlement uh, occurring at the northern end of the culvert. and The joints, there was Viking Johnson proprietary joints between sections of the culvert. They were in poor condition. The culvert is not a perfectly straight line over the 700 metres of culvert uh, from the sandstone discontinuity down to the outfall. There were changes in direction between 21 degrees uh, right down to 5 degrees, of four changes of direction, I think. So, so basically, the culvert, the condition of the culvert from our investigation was showing culvert in poor condition. Just uh, a, a, a simple a diagram of it, what is showing what is involved in horizontal directional drill. And I apologize because most people here will know what horizontal directional drill is. But basically, horizontal directional drill, there is a simplistic diagram in the bottom uh, right-hand corner of this uh, pre slide. Really, it's where you want to cross or under a canal or an area of poor ground or a road or a railway. And uh, really, the process here is drill a small pilot bore uh, from your launch side, if you want to put it that way, to your uh, exit side, uh, enlarge that by reaming and then pull in your service, whether it's a pipe or whether it's a duct or whatever. The, on the rig site, there is what's termed in the, in the business a rig site and a pipe site. On the rig site is made up, uh, it requires an approximate area maybe of about 1,500 square metres. It's made up of the actual drilling rig itself, which is item number one here. The control uh, tower or control office, if you want to put it that way, generators, mud recycling unit. One of the primary consumables of a directional drill really is mud. Uh, mud brings the arisings, brings the drillings back to the surface. It actually drives the, the, the mud motor, uh, it lubricates the motor, uh, it, 
it cools the motor as well, and it also stabilizes the bore. So, so mud, bentonite mud with uh, additives, right, uh, is a primary consumable in horizontal directional drill, and it's a specialist uh, profession, really, at the end of the day, is designing the mud for uh, horizontal directional drill. So this is a schematic, really, of what uh, intensity of plant you have on the rig site. And on the pipe site itself, you have uh, your pipeline strung out, ready for pullback. And as the pipe is fed in, sorry, as the reaming uh, takes place, first of all, you have to add pipe strings to that, right, such that you have access and have control over the HDD process at all times. Once the hole is reamed to the required size, you start your pullback. And uh, really, the, the pipe side, less area is required, but one of the major uh, area requirements on the pipe side is the string out of the pipe to be pulled in. Um, the general requirements of HDD, I'll just summarise them quickly and uh, how they apply to your particular project. As I've said, adequate working space for the rig side plant and for the pipe side plant, uh, including pipe string out. In our case, on the Carrington power plant side, the, the pipe side really had to be the power plant site because this HCD, if there was going to be horizontal directional drill in this particular project, it was going to be 1,100 metres. And at the jetty road end, we didn't have control of all of the land down there and you could not string out 1,100 metres of pipe or indeed 500 metres of pipe. So really, uh, from starters, on the Carrington project, the, the rig site would have to be the southern end or at Jetty Road. The pipe site would be the per plant site. Now, there was issues with that really at the end of the day that look, if the pipe is strung out on the per plant site, it could ultimately cause uh, land or area of land not to be handed over to the per plant contractor. But we face that. Uh, key requirements of HCD, of any HCD, is look, maximize the pipeline curvatures both in the horizontal and in the, the vertical. Uh, just when that simple diagram of horizontal directional drill, you just see horizontal directional drill in the vertical plane. Uh, in most horizontal directional drills, there is actually curvature in the um, horizontal as well. And look, you want to minimize compound curvature. That means curving in the vertical and curving in the horizontal. So a key requirement of a successful HCD is Maximize your pipe radii and minimize your compound curvature. Prudently remain within the landowner easements if there are some and planning boundaries as well. Maximize the length of pipe within good drilling ground to ensure a stable bore. And in our case, although we didn't have uh, sandstone bedrock all the way, uh, we were uh, fortunate to have sandstone bedrock there, which uh, Sherwood sandstone is a good drillable rock, as they say in the business. Uh, provide ad adequate clearances to exist existing infrastructure. We had culverts, we had an existing cooling water pump house basement, so we required or would require to provide adequate clearance to those. Avoid opening up contaminated land. We would have contaminated land at the rig site, but look, unfortunately, the um, land available really dictated that the, the, the rig site would be uh, at the jetty road end adjacent to Pixnook landfill. Mitigate the potential for damage to adjacent infrastructure. Uh, you've seen uh, in our embankment stability analysis that we have highlighted or we have identified local, significant local slips along that embankment. And at the Jetty Road end, uh, we also identified that from the 16.5 metre level up to the 19.5 metre level, there was an embankment instability issue there which would require stabilisation. Another key factor or key component of a uh, successful horizontal directional drill is mitigate frack out of the mud. If frack out of the mud does occur, it's not necessarily an environmental disaster, but for the likes of Manchester Ship Canal, uh, it would be a showstopper. With regard to uh, how the current in HDD was progressed, the client actually procured a horizontal directional drill consultant Land and Marine Pipe Engineering, LMPA, to carry out a detailed appraisal of the proposed horizontal directional drill 
for Carrington. And their conclusion was that a horizontal directional drill, although 1,100 metres is a long horizontal directional drill, uh, was feasible on this particular, uh, in this particular location. Right. Looking at the outcome of the pipe in culvert study, uh, the pipe in culvert study, Langer actually carried out this study and applied a lot of good engineering to the actual proposal itself. Uh, you will see that their proposal here was, look, the roof of the culvert had to be cut for man access for a start and for getting the pipe in. Uh, that would pose problems for the stability of the culvert and the embankments as well, and for the safety of the workers. But that was not within their remit. Uh, the pipe and culvert option was install, first of all, install a U-frame, a steel U-frame as shown in blue there, uh, to stabilise or provide stability to the walls of the culvert. Then provide uh, a concrete base on which a precast concrete channel would be dropped in. The precast concrete channel would, the pipeline would be welded in sections and dropped into this precast concrete channel uh, on which there would naturally be a lid and the roof of the culvert would be reinstated. Uh, with regard to this culvert, first of all it's designed as a pipeline or a culvert full of water. Uh, so the putting the pipeline into the culvert would not permit a lot of grouting or installing concrete into the void, the remaining void area. So the proposal here was uh, the void that was left or after this construction would be filled with expanded polystyrene blocks. And you can see these uh, shown on either side and on the top there. Look, an assessment of the pipe and culvert option versus the horizontal directional drill was carried out. It was detailed and it was uh, head scratching, if you want to uh, pardon the phrase. Look, uh, the, with regard to the horizontal directional drill, it was decided this was feasible, although it was long. The risk with any HDD is that horizontal directional drill is the pipe gets stuck. And really, if that happens, you lose the pipe, or the potential is there to lose the pipe. And uh, look, you have to start again, really, you know, if you can't unstick the pipe. Uh, on this particular horizontal directional drill, there was a risk associated with the drilling uh, at the jetty road end, which I keep referring to, where there was a potential for uh, encountering contaminated land, although the horizontal directional drill was not planned to be take place through the landfill. We were adjacent to a landfill embankment and because there was no records of the landfill and how it was constructed and how it was capped, we, we had to be mindful of that. With regard to the pipeline or pipeline in the culvert, the, the embankments uh, in their current condition presented major safety risks for the construction. And uh, just looking at this little diagram down below here, look, First of all, to create a safe environment, um, if this was going to be feasible for the construction of the pipeline in the culvert, something had to be done with these embankments. Look, the ultimate, the Rolls Royce would be regrade these embankments. Uh, that for 750 metres, embankments 23 metres high, that was really unrealistic. First of all, it was a huge amount of earthworks. There was limited uh, available construction earthworks area. And also there was the unknown that you could come across any type of contamination because the bo both the ice disposal area and the Peaks Nook landfill, as I said, was not really a controlled landfill. Uh, look, another option would be provide piled, piled walling with freeboard to support the embankments. That's along this particular side here, right? Um, look, First of all, there was a load restriction on the culvert. There was limited access between the culvert and the embankment. To install sheet pilings, and sheet piling option here would probably and likely have uh, induced further slips in the embankment. So should sheet piling be a possibility, there was a problem with plant on top of the culvert. There was a problem with the plant was sitting here with reach of the plant to install sheet piles. The other option would be uh, install contiguous uh, piling wall right along the, the culvert as well. Both of these options, for a start, uh, their constructability was questionable right in terms of uh, the existing uh, restrictions that were there. And also, if you did manage to install sheet pile wall or a contiguous pile wall along this particular culvert, you were going to interfere with, interfere with the ground water network uh, that existed there. Uh, 
with the pipeline and the culvert option as well, remedial works to provide a culvert with a design life of 40 years uh, would be expensive, would be prohibitive, effectively. We were not successful in getting uh, the owner of the culvert's permission to actually do destruct investigation of uh, the structural capacity of that culvert. The pipeline and option work itself, as you can see, it's bespoke. It would require a steep learning curve or an ongoing learning curve on behalf of the contractor. And there was limited workspace adjacent to the canal. So look, the end result of this appraisal or assessment of pipe and culvert versus HDD option was that horizontal directional drill option was the best technical economic solution with lowest risk. Uh, the contract itself, uh, as I said earlier, it was design and build contract, would be a design and build contract, yellow book, FIDIC yellow book, conditions of contract for civil engineering works and mechanical and electrical works. Uh, the tender would include, uh, or did include, proposed HDD solution for that section of pipeline along the canal. However, the design responsibility is with the contractor, so the contractor would be required to adopt the design or revise the design, or if he did not agree with horizontal direction drill in this particular area, then provide a suitable alternative such that the gas pipeline uh, could be constructed. Uh, following competitive tender process, the contract was awarded to Speak by Utilities Limited and the gas pipeline construction, while there were some advanced design works done, financial close in this project was achieved in September 2012. Uh, there was some advanced design work done by the contractor that was negotiated into his appointment. Gas pipeline construction was commenced in September 2012 and the gas pipeline construction was substantially completed in October 2013. The, the horizontal directional drill profile, actually the final profile proposed by the contractor, as I've said, so uh, where the main contractor, the horizontal directional drill specialist uh, employed by Sol, speak it by Utilities Limited, was a company called HDI, Horizontal Directional Drilling International. They were actually a sub-co within the group in which Speaker Pike were part of. Uh, Horizontal Direction, HDI, actually designed the profile in conjunction with LMR, uh, LMR or Horizontal Directional Drilling Company in the UK as well. So uh, HDI in collaboration with LMR actually detailed or drafted the final profile for the horizontal directional drill. Uh, I'm sorry that the detail here is not very good, right, but look, it really shows the main components. This is a horizontal directional drill, 1,100 metres long. Uh, in the vertical, uh, the first of all, at its deepest, the pipeline would be 20 metres below the top of sandstone, and total would be 35 metres below ground level. Uh, it did avoid the culvert, the piles to the culvert. It, there was a five metre clearance to the CW pump house. And also it included a proposal to install a casing, a 70 metre long casing at the Peaksnook landfill end uh, to avoid risk of uh, encountering contaminated material and also to provide stability to the bore in that area. With regard to, uh, you can see that First of all, in the vertical plane, uh, it's all nice curvature, but this, uh, in the horizontal plane, this gas pipeline actually weaves considerably. And uh, look, although I compound curvature, as I said previously, uh, is minimizing of compound curvature is a basic requirement. You can see here, uh, sorry, it's not on the sketch, but the maximum vertical curvature is uh, 800 meters uh, radius in this area here, slightly more up, uh, slightly less, sorry, more, I, I'm getting mixed up between maximum and minimum. Really, you want to maximize your curvatures. So the minimum vertical curvature we have here is 800 meters. In the horizontal, uh, the minimum curvatures are of the order of 2,000 meter radius. And look, one of the rules, guiding rules, about curvature and horizontal directional drill. It depends on the diameter of the pipe. It depends on the yield strength of the steel pipe as well. But uh, a ruling guideline would be that your curvatures uh, should be not less than a thousand times the uh, diameter of the pipe. So look, the scene here was set. The horizontal directional drill profile is created. It did require a casing. 
And this horizontal direction drill profile, it met all the requirements. We were within, or it was within uh, the easement requirements, it was within the planning requirements, and uh, it was also, it did also avoid existing infrastructure. So the proprietary works required was install the casing, and also the, the contractor proposed that in this area of uh, embankment instability uh, that a soil nailing solution would be implemented. So, uh, look, before the horizontal directional drill could commence, first of all, the pipe string, the 1100 metres of pipe had to be welded uh, because of uh, uh, available or limited available access, it would be three strings comprising a 552 metre long, a 324 metre long and a 260 metre long string. So, the, this photograph actually shows you this pipes strong and ready for installation uh, as part of the HCD process. The uh, soil nailing uh, was implemented quite quickly. The soil nailing for this embankment uh, comprised three rows of soil nails. The soil nails used were 32 millimeter diameter uh, self-drilling nails, six meters long. And the loads in these soil nails, the soil nails are a vertical separation of 750 mil. I think you can approximately see them there, 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 and there, right? Uh, vertical separation of 750 mil, horizontal separation of 1.5 meters. The actual pipeline, just in case you get worried that the pipeline would be going through these soil nails, the pipeline itself, the, the vertical profile of the pipeline would be coming along here, just at the toe of that embankment. Uh, the casing, installation of the casing, what is proposed here was a 1.2 metre diameter casing, steel casing, installed into the sandstone. This would require a total length of 70 metres long casing. Uh, this would be installed, the subcontractor used for the installation of this casing was a company, Lan and a Finnish company, and their proposed construction technique was uh, use American auger with a down the hole drilling head, right? And look, I don't want to labour this point too much, but I think I should describe what this drilling head is or what it comprises. You can see this is the, sorry, uh, this is the 1.2 metre diameter casing here. First of all, a coffer dam was required to construct this casing. This is the 1.2 metre diameter casing. You can see a drilling head here with a lot of studs on it, which grinds the actual material in front of it. Uh, the compressed air is flushed uh, through these uh, openings here, and there are flutes here which bring the ground material back through these openings onto the auger, which is behind this head. Uh, the cutting ring, a cutting ring here was used in this technique. The primary objective of using this cutting ring was that when you reach the sandstone interface, that in order to anchor the casing into the sandstone, the cutting head would actually cut through the sandstone bedrock and ensure that the casing was installed in the sandstone or embedded in the sandstone. Uh, just. Uh, some of the features of uh, that particular, sorry, uh, you can see here the bare drilling head itself, right, and the uh, auger behind it. The, this, this drilling head is a bit like uh, putting a bulb into a bulb holder, right? You put the drilling head forward, it engages into the cutting head. The cutting head is not welded or fixed to either the drilling head or to the casing. There is lugs on the drilling head here. You can see a shoulder on the drilling head here, which hammers on a rim around the inside of the casing, and that drives the casing forward. So the this is without the cutting head. And sorry, I know it keeps uh, moving forward, but uh, the cutting head really, I just want to labour the point here, the cutting head is its more or less, the drilling head is rotated into it, it's not <coughs> welded to either the drilling head or to the casing. And uh, probably one of the reasons why I'm labouring this point a little bit is because the casing actually got stuck at 65 metres, which was a major difficulty and major concern. The um, First of all, uh, what was done once this casing becomes stuck was look, establish what are the actual ground conditions. As I've said, we uh, provided uh, site investigations uh, comprising of 30 boreholes 
and we the location where the casing actually became stuck at 65 meters we were fortunate that we had two boreholes uh, GP02 and GP05 very very close to where this became stuck and given the profile and given the location where the case became stuck it was well the borehole information showed that the casing was probably in sand, in gravels and was had not reached the sandstone uh, the contractor immediately in fairness to speak of uh, they were very very proactive in addressing solutions to this problem they, re they realized the uh, the severity of the situation really at the end of the day and first of all the casing head had to be uh, the drilling head had to be recovered and this casing if it couldn't be progressed further uh, some other measures would have to be provided uh, to ensure the HCD was anchored or was drillable through the gravels that occurred just above the sandstone bedrock. So the first thing that was done was the contractor actually constructed two boreholes either side of the pipeline itself, right? And uh, the, the boreholes confirmed that the drill, the casing, the stub casing was still in gravel. Uh, a second thing that was done was that uh, just in case uh, there was a lot of wonderment, if you want to put it that way, as to what actually was happening here, there was a worry possibly that the actual casing and head uh, had actually become somewhat buckled and maybe it was sort of forming a U or a J, right? And although this was a remote possibility, uh, a, a company was actually uh, engaged at relatively low cost to actually, uh, they actually survey pipeline routes and they were able to put a gyroscope device down in the center of the augers right to the drilling head and plot the profile of the casing and the casing was practically straight line on course in its required position so um with regard to the drill recovery um the contractor proposed that if the casing was jacked back or could be jacked back a distance of four or five hundred millimeters that the the drilling could recommence and the casing installed to its final position and there was a lot of discussion about look, what friction forces external friction forces were uh, would be appropriate for this 1.2 meter diameter casing in fact if you do the uh, calculation as per skin friction on piles you actually would calculate that the skin friction on this particular length of casing, uh, 65 meters, would be of the order of 800 tons. Uh, the contractor was uh, one of his fallback positions was and was that it didn't require a 800 ton effort to install the casing, but that there really was <coughs> understandable because of the hammer process number one. So what what the contractor proposed after some debate was that look they would try to jack out this casing, but they would lubricate the casing as well. And what at three o'clock, six o'clock, uh, nine o'clock, a drilling technique was used where bentonite was pumped along the actual casing right to the end of where the casing was. And in fact, the drill head, small uh, 100 mil diameter drill head, actually progressed beyond the point where the casing was stuck. Look, the process, this process, although Jacking forces of 700 tons were used. Uh, this process didn't move the casing. There was big uh, safety issues here. There was major forces being applied. And look, the first of all, we were working in an area where embankments were uh, susceptible to slip, if you want to put it that way. We were working in a coffer dam, which was really not designed uh, for these type of horizontal roads, but performed admirably. Uh, at 700 tons, this casing did not move and uh, another option had to be selected right the other option was you drill or you install a 1.4 meter diameter casing over the 1.2 meter diameter sleeve and you jack out the annulus of soil between the 1.4 and the 1.2 now the, that actually provide well there was two um, relaxations if you want to put it uh, provided here. First of all, installing the 1.4 meter diameter casing. By blasting out the inner annulus, you were reducing the internal skin friction. So you're really dealing with uh, external skin friction in getting this 1.4 meter diameter sleeve in. The 1.4 meter diameter as well, you were actually reducing 
uh, the external skin friction on the 1.2 meter diameter casing. The 1.4 meter diameter sleeve was actually jacked into 42 meters along the 1.2 meter sleeve. Now you might ask yourself the question is how do you keep the, the separation between the 1.4 and the 1.2? How do you stop the 1.2 or the 1.4 actually tipping into uh, the 1.2? But there were spacers, uh, angle spacers welded on the inside of the 1.4 the casing with the heel pointing towards the 1.2 and they uh, ensured that there was a 100 mil annulus approximately kept right along the 1.2 meter casing. Uh, as I said, the casing was driven, this 1.4 meter sleeve was driven to 42 meters and the, the 1.2 4 meter casing was actually used then as an anchor to jack out the 1.2 meter casing and the casing was jacked out albeit applying uh, push loads or jacking forces here just sl less than 500 tons this casing was actually jacked out when it was jacked out half a meter the contractor actually tried to rotate the drilling head and it wouldn't rotate so the casing had to be driven out or jacked out the full way and the soil unloaded from the casing, the, from the augers. Uh, there was no damage on the cutting head, there was no damage on the drilling head, everything looked intact and the contractor, the subcontractor insisted that he could use this process uh, as a matter of putting in the drilling head and driving the casing uh, to its final position uh, in the sandstone. Unfortunately, the casing uh, and drilling head, the 1.2 meter diameter casing drilling head was driven in again. There was very, very much reduced friction now because there was actually uh, almost 35 meters of external skin friction was removed uh, and the casing again became stuck at 68 meters and had to be jacked out again. Uh, at this point, uh, look, there was a lot of discussion about what, what should be done and what actually was done was the cutting ring was removed. The, the danger with the cutting ring was and the horizontal directional drill was if the cutting ring became detached from the drilling head then it was pro a possible obstruction to the horizontal directional drill. So you really needed to know where the cutting head was. Either it was embedded in the sandstone or it wasn't there at all really. So after the second attempt the cutting head was removed from the drilling head and the casing was driven as far as possible into the sandstone. Uh, the dr casing was driven to 71 metres. So unfortunately with the removal of the, um, the casing, the 1.2 metre casing twice, uh, it was, there was a worry that uh, subsidence would occur, local subsidence would occur in the area of the pullback and unfortunately that's what did happen. There was some local subsidence occurred at the 65 metre level and for 5 and 10 metres either side of that resulting in, this is your more or less conventional or your uh, typical loss of support to the toe of the embankment. Subsidence occurred here. Uh, this block of soil rotated forward and you can see cracking occurred here at the toe of the embankment. This is a serious worry and uh, immediately what was done was the short term solution here was uh, these cracks were filled with uh, sand, dense sand, uh, granular material, gravel and the actual void that occurred, there was 60 tonnes of granular material uh, loaded into the actual void to stabilise the embankment in the short term. Uh, wh what was done in the long term was that uh, soil columns were actually installed, sorry, uh, soil columns were actually installed in this area here. Uh, I know soil, soil columns is the layman's terms uh, for these uh, columns, but really uh, this was a mixture of soil and cement, uh, wet cement binder to construct a block of soil columns at two meter centers uh, 12 meters into the material. This was uh, constructed by deep soil mixing uh, with her specialist designers Burn, and Burn Libby and uh, look monitoring of this embankment was ongoing before the subsidence occurred and has been continuing since uh, the remedial work, the permanent remedial work was carried out and it appears the embankment is stable at this point.
uh, that's just a shot of the soil column drilling machine. We could not load, this is the embankment that, on which the soil nails had been uh, constructed or provided and it was fortunate that it was stabilised because although this drilling rig is 20 tonnes and it was quite uh, light, uh, it was fortunate that the soil nailing had been carried out this embankment. Getting back to the horizontal directional drill, uh, back to our rig site, and uh, the Carrington rig site, uh, getting back to the generic or the simplistic diagram, uh, we had the coffer dam in which the uh, horizontal directional dr drill would be installed, uh, just running through the pipe strings, uh, nine metre long pipe strings bank, which are loaded. Once the horizontal directional drill, the pilot drill, the pilot drill for this horizontal directional drill was 20 inches diameter, the hole would be reamed out by a reamer out to uh, 34 inches diameter, which is 860 mil. Uh, look, the drilling head requires, if you, when you're progressing the drilling head, you keep adding pipe strings, nine metre long pipe strings in this kit, to push the the drilling head along the, the, the design profile. Uh, the design profile, right OK, is controlled using a paratrack system and is meticulously, the location of the drilling head is meticulously, meticulously checked to ensure, in this case, that we follow the horizontal and vertical profile and ensure that we re uh, remain within easements. The, uh, the control cabin itself key piece of equipment here is sitting right on top of the coffer dam and a mud recycling unit which is a major piece of kit uh, uh, for any horizontal directional process or directional drill uh, job uh, is located uh, this is a picture of it is located actually on the eastern side of the drilling rig just uh, before the horizontal direction drill, before we get into the actual horizontal directional drill process itself, uh, I've said there previously that the casing was installed into the sandstone as far as was reasonably possible. It wasn't known whether this casing would be embedded in the sandstone. So before the horizontal directional drill was commenced, uh, what actually was done was uh, a low strength grout was filled into the casing uh, and allowed to permeate into the gravel which is overlying the sandstone in order to provide a bound matrix of gravel such that this was drillable and solid in the horizontal directional drill process itself and that collapsing of gravels into this this void here would not take place gravels is the sort of you don't want gravels in any horizontal directional drill um, the <coughs> drilling head itself because we had a 70 meter length of casing and you needed to ensure that the drilling head, the pilot drill actually uh, started in the center of the casing. We had a 70 meter long casing. Spacers were used to support the pipe strings to ensure that the drilling head was center and the drilling commenced on the, the center of the ground, whether it was sandstone or graded gravel at the bottom of the casing. How that was done was, uh, these these are nine inch diameter uh, pipe strings as I've referred to previously, a 13 inch diameter, and it's sorry for using nine inch and 13 inch, but it's what was the terms and what was used in this particular job. Uh, the A 13 inch diameter hollow pipe was actually provided with spacing supports such that at all times down the casing, the actual pipe string was center on the casing itself. Uh, you might say, well, look here, if you had a 20 inch diameter pilot drill, how was this sort of worked using uh, a nine or a 13 inch hollow um, section for the, the pipe string? What actually happened was that the the, the pilot drill was installed at the end of the 13 inch hollow pipe and the 13 inch hollow pipes with their spacings were fed down the drill. Um, this is just a, a video of the pilot drill itself. As I said, the pilot drill on this particular job was 20 inches uh, and over a length of 1100 meters there was vertical uh, the vertical profile had curvatures of 800 metres and the horizontal uh, had curvatures of 2,000 metres. 
the 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 drilling the pilot drill started um, and following well it took 12 days in total at 12 hour drillings to actually this is it's pretty mundane here right but after 12 days of drilling the pilot drill itself exited uh, within half a meter of the design location uh, this is a little bit uh, a bit slow really but it's relieving at the end of the day that look the pilot drill actually was coming through at the correct location this uh, pilot drill as i said it took 12 days of drilling in some cases because there was serious restriction on the easement the contractor had to spend a little bit of time actually shaving and ensuring that he was on the correct course the the the, the course or the alignment of the pilot drill was continually monitored there was a, a guide wire strung out along the pipe culvert or about along the culvert on the roof of the culvert and this was used to actually in well to plot the uh, profile of the pilot drill. Just uh, moving on to the HDD, the horizontal directional drill reaming. Uh, as I said, the pilot drill was 20 inches diameter. The reamer, and this is the reamer itself, right? Okay, the reamer itself is uh, 34 inches diameter, 860 mil. It's a pretty fierce looking piece of equipment here. This is it in situ here uh, on the way back this is the pipe string actually pulling the reamer this bulbous thing in front here the reason for that is to drive this 13 inch hollow core section which existed at the casing end drive that out in front of the reamer so the reaming process you can see it here the reamer is actually on its way back in to the hole the the reaming on this particular contract and uh, well sorry just the pipe strings then are fed on are fed on you can see a pipe string here continuously pipe strings are added on at the reaming end these would be the pipe strings on which the actual pipe was pulled back into the bore the the, the reaming process on this particular job it took a total of eight days actually at 24 hours uh, reaming the hole up from 20 inches to 34 inches is look uh, it's it's time consuming and in fairness to the contractor the uh, there was no hitches along the way uh, there was no stops in this reaming process and as i said it took a total of eight days at 24 hours working per day the actual pullback itself um, uh, this is a, s a short video of the pullback the pullback itself the pipe strings uh, are shown here this is the first string 552 meters what really happens on the pullback is this, this pipe string itself is laid out on a horizontal curve of 500 metres radius. The, in the entry into the pit, there are eight support points. Uh, side booms and excavators were used to support uh, the pipe to get the correct angle of entry, which was eight degrees. The, uh, what happens is, as the horizontal directional drill pullback is carried out from the rig end, the machine is pulling back the pipe rods the the pipe strings nine meter long are taken off nine meters at a time and in the time period to remove the nine meter uh, long pipe string these excavators move and re-sling again and the, the process is look pull back nine meters change the the pipe rod move the excavators back the lifting point back and this just keeps going on right now for this particular uh HDD because we had three strings there would be two stops to do the actual wells of the pipe uh, and the, the wells look the weld had to be made the allowed to cool and the corrosion protection also had to be applied and the weld had to be tested so in this pullback there was a stop for to do two wells as well uh, I'll play this video as best I can uh, this is the start of the pullback I'm just showing a shot here of the lifting points the the pullback was actually started at 9 a.m. on the 15th of May uh, 2013 this is actually showing the pullback uh, as I said the pullback had to be stopped uh, to do the two wells and uh, look in total the pullback took a total of 22 hours this shows the pipe string being pulled back, pipe string being unloaded, uh, the excavator.
excavators uh, re-slinging at the far end. The pipe, the pullback itself took a total of 22 hours. There was a stopping, it was stopped for two periods of five hours to do the weld, uh, test the weld and do the corrosion protection. So, uh, look, in total, this pullback took a total of 22 hours. In reality, it took a total of 10 hours. It was successfully completed and, uh, look, uh, it was a very, well, this was a very positive horizontal directional drill operation. It was, I think in the UK, this one here is definitely in the top, UK and Ireland, it's in the top uh, 10 of HDDs in terms of length and complexity. Uh, just, this is the pipe actually through in the cofferdam, and this is the end pipe uh, on the pipe side. Look, our pipeline constructions on this particular gas pipeline, I know I've laboured the horizontal directional drill. Uh, we had two other uh, trenchless construction uh, locations. One was, well, both of them were micro tunnels. One of them was 70 metres long. The other was 35 metres long. These were crossing public roads. There was a lot of open trench, uh, sheeted open trench construction in this because of poor ground. And also, in some cases, we had to maintain access road. This is a long jetty road. We had to maintain access for uh, vehicles to the shell unloading facility. The current status of this project is, look, the, the AGIs, the above ground installations at Partington, this is a shot of the AGI in Partington. This is the feeder pipe coming from the NG, NG feeder. This is our, the start of our gas supply line to the power plant. Uh, this is the pigging facility provided uh, at the Partington AGI. This is the kind of the above ground installation on the Carrington site itself. Uh, just about you can see the pipe coming above ground into the AGI and uh, the, the gas supply follows this particular path here and this is the blank flange waiting for a connection for the gas supply to the combined cycle gas turbine. This is pigging facility here. So this gas pipeline uh, project 1.2 two kilometres. It was constructed in or completed in October 2013. The, the, the area where the pipeline was strung out was handed back without any claim arising from the EPC contractor. And the, the reason why, as I said, this was not critical path. The, the actual gas supply for the commissioning of the power plant project, which is on target, is required uh, January 2015. So the gas pipeline is sitting there more or less complete for the last year. Uh, look, it is nitrogen filled to uh, prevent corrosion to the inside of the pipe until gas is actually fed into the pipe. Uh, so look, uh, this is an overview of the Carrington Power Plant project as it stands. Uh, the 816 megawatt power plant is practically uh, reaching commissioning stage at this point. Uh, this is the end of our, or the terminal point for our little gas pipeline project. So, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Donald, for a very interesting lecture. Um, I'll now just open it to the floor for any questions which people may have. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, just in asking questions, we have a number of roving mics here. If you just wait for the microphone, if you have a question, and maybe just identify who you are um, as you're speaking. Thank you. Kieran Feehan, um, Donald, great, uh, excellent presentation. Uh, you talked about the sandstone discontinuity at one end, and you, um, maybe I missed it, but you didn't seem to talk about how you, you handled that uh, at the end of the day. I wonder, could you, was that something I missed? Or, uh? No, well, the horizontal directional drill itself, <coughs> on the profile that we had, well, the first of all, the, the HCD contractors really were... Uh, uh, very uh, 
impressed really, I, I shouldn't be using that word right, at this extent of site investigations, information available to them. The Sandstone discontinuity, uh, look, when you came through on the profile on which the HCD was actually constructed, when you came through the Sandstone discontinuity, you came into a stiff clay, right, which was good material for a HCD as well. Uh, up near where the exit point where the county and AGA was, there was some uh, lenses of, you were moving from stiff clay up into uh, some lenses of gravel and some made ground as well, right? There was some concern about uh, the lenses of gravel, right? But when you come through the sandstone discontinuity, first of all, when the contractor, the, the fact that the sandstone discontinuity was identified and that the profile of the sandstone sandstone discontinuity in plan was approximately plotted using the geophysics, right? It allowed this contractor to be very, very careful, very, very slow in his drilling through this particular location. But when he came through the sandstone discontinuity, or when the drill came through the sandstone discontinuity, it came into a stiff clay, and this was okay for the horizontal directional drilling process. Um, I have a question myself, um, uh, Michael Goss, Vice Chair of the Civil Division. Just in terms of the um, concept design stage, what kind of time frame did you have, have to operate in, or what period did you have for the concept design? The, uh, in, in terms of carrying out all those site investigations, carrying out the geophysics as well, uh, doing the studies with regard to the horizontal directional drill option and the pipe and culvert option, it was a total of 15 months. And then just in terms of the pipeline material, was that uh, specified by the client or was that left to the well, contractor as part of the design well, process? Well, the, the pipeline material is really, uh, I'm not a specialist in this area, but uh, first of all, the location, the depth at which the pipeline is uh, constructed, the design operating pressure, and also the terrain. This was in the sub, a, a suburban, if you want to call it that, location, right? So all these things add into what is the material and what is the thickness of material because there's a societal risk thing, right? Okay, and proximity to buildings issue. I'm not very familiar with this process at all, but the material was uh, uh, L415MB X60 pipe uh, with a yield of uh, 400, 415 newtons per millimeter squared and uh, a wall thickness of 19 mil. But the actual material of the pipe and the thickness of the pipe it, there's a lot of contributing criteria to that actual, uh, the end result there. And just a final question there, uh, the corrosion protection to the pipe, what, what type or what uh, was used? Exter the external corrosion protection to this pipe is 700 microns of uh, fusion epoxy bonded or fusion bonded epoxy coating. Also, that's the primary corrosion protection. There is also cathodic protection as a secondary uh, corrosion protection to this pipe. Now, there was uh, isolation joints. Uh, the corrosion protection uh, within the HDD portion, right, okay, is an impressed current cathodic protection system. And the corrosion protection from the Partington AGA right up to the the commencement of the HCD portion is uh, a sacrificial uh, anode uh, cathodic protection system. Thank you. I have one question on the root options um, to Mr. Mask. Um, we were totally constrained on the root option. You had, you'd obviously considered the culvert as well. But I mean, could you have considered completely alternative routes? Well, I'll tell you, uh, yeah, and it might have been easier to do this, right? Because uh, this was uh, this was a challenging pipeline by uh, by any stretch of the ma imagination. Look, first of all, the planning was obtained for the power plant and for the gas pipeline. Uh, there was the risk, first of all, that there was an easier route. There was easier routes. A horizontal directional drill, it might be getting too ambitious, right? But a horizontal directional drill, at, uh, you know, to do a horizontal directional drill from the Manchester Road end of uh, Jetty Lane onto a particular site would have been about another, uh, it had been 1,500, 1,600 metres. And, but the problem there was that you would have to go back to planning, you would have to go to landowners, you'd have to negotiate new easements, right? And there was a lot of unknowns and, and the client uh, were not keen to do that because it would have meant, uh, could have meant a significant delay to the project. But look, uh, you know, if there was a free hand here to choose an alternative route, 
I think everyone would have been, uh, well, without any constraints, everyone would have been going for that, you know. Okay, um, I don't know if there are any more questions. Um, we do, yes. Uh, John O'Sullivan from UCD. Uh, uh, I'm, only, I'm curious as much as anything else. Was there much pub public opposition to the proposed pipeline or the pipeline as constructed? Well, not that I'm aware of, right? You know, look, uh, you know, uh, as I said, this project was owned by a previous developer, and in terms of our work and progressing the gas pipeline construction, there was. Look, first of all, there was uh, one of the things that the client insisted on was, look, good uh, cooperation, good liaison with all stakeholders, right? And, look, you know, that was implemented rigidly through the construction period. So that people were stakeholders and neighbouring communities were very well informed of the stages of the project and any implications in terms of traffic and whatever, right? You know, if there was piling being done, if there was noise being generated, right? There was a lot of constraints in that regard, but they were adhered to. Okay, thank you. Okay, if we have no more questions, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Kieran Fian of our civil division to do the vote of thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Chair, and others who are working on this. Thank you, uh, Chair and uh, Donald. Um, an excellent presentation um, and using uh, all of the technologies available to you, PowerPoint, videos, uh, diagrams and so on, which I think made a quite complex subject very uh, accessible uh, to the whole audience. Uh, from my point of view, uh, I, I think it's great to see the amount of data collection that went into the project ahead of time, which, uh, as you clearly showed, was of benefit to the contractor both in the design phase and in figuring out what to do as the, as the project evolved. Um, Again, good to see the use of the latest technologies in the in the geotechnical side with the range of geo, GPR and uh, resistivity, magnetic, electrical, and so on. Uh, again, giving us or giving yourselves and the contractor a good idea of what to do in what was clearly a very challenging project. I'm sure there was a lot of uh, fingers being crossed, notwithstanding all of the all of the work that went in uh, as you're drilling the pipe and so on. So, on behalf of the civil division, on behalf of the audience here. I'd like to thank you very much for the, the huge amount of time and effort clearly that was put into uh, putting this presentation together for us uh, this evening. I'd like to ask the audience to join me in, in acknowledging that work in the, in the usual manner. <laughs>